Teller. Ah, Teller. Checking in for UFC Vegas 89. As you guys could probably hear, I'm still under the weather. All right. This thing started the Friday before UFC 299. It's been hanging around. I apologize for not getting that prop video out to you guys for UFC Vegas 88. It's because I had absolutely no voice. Uh, my voice just kind of came back. And uh, we will get over this thing. And if you're wondering why I look a little ghostly and a little messed up, it's because this thing's been been hanging around. All right, guys. So we will get through it. I will deliver a another entertaining episode for you guys here. Um, you know, UFC Vegas 89. We got Rose Namajunas taking on Amanda Rebus. Rose is looking to get a W up in the flyweight division. Of course, in her last fight, things didn't really go her way against Manon Farot. Uh, Amanda Rebus, a much respected fighter up in the division. And uh, we'll see if, if Rose can get that first W up there. I'll let you know if I think that she's going to get that done. Other than that, uh, I don't know if you guys been uh been hearing the word around the town. Uh, the Teller's new nickname is uh, Teller the Dog Hunter a.k.a. Uh, the bounty hunter, whatever you want, dog the bounty hunter. Um, the teller has been hunting these dogs down. And you guys know, as of recently, it really started uh, with that free play that I gave to you guys on Ilya Taporia, that Michael Venom page. This past weekend, we hit big dog plays, okay, on Danny Silva and on Christian Rodriguez, okay? So some big underdog plays have been hitting here for the teller. And, uh, you know, w whenever you see... Another dog hitting, dog play hitting. You're going to start to see the teller with the nice blonde mullet, uh, okay, with it dangling in the wind. We'll have all types of content coming to you guys as the dog, uh, as dog the bounty hunter there. So shout out to everyone that follows me on Instagram. Uh, how about my boy Brian Battle sharing a post uh, with the teller? Uh, got, got some new followers coming in. My boy Brian Battle. You guys know I had some. Uh, so some bold thoughts, uh, or I wouldn't even say bold. I think everyone pretty much agreed with me that, that Lusa weaseled his way out of, out of that situation there. And my boy Battle agreed. He shared the post there. So shout out to everyone that's following me on IG at MMA Fortune Teller underscore. And uh, won't hold you guys up too much. We're going to jump in the first fight right now. If you guys can, though, please like this video. Subscribe to the channel. It really means a lot to me. You guys keep giving me those likes. You guys keep subbing. I'm going to give you guys more free plays here on the channel. I promise you guys that. Uh, and if you guys want to work with me for my official plays, don't ever uh, hesitate to reach out to me. I got my email and my Instagram and Twitter scrolling below. Shoot me a message however you like. All right, guys, let's jump into the first fight. Uh -huh. Welcome to the show. This is the MMA fortune teller. Yeah. The MMA fortune teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. Kicking the card off. Uh, well, at least as of now, the UFC is saying that this is the first fight of the event. I don't see why this fight would be the first fight of the card. This is actually, uh, this is a fight that could really be on the main card of this event. Uh, I'm excited for this one. Mick Parkin taking on Muhammad Usman, uh, two heavyweight fighters that are, are still somewhat green. I know Usman's 34 years old, but he's still a, a, a greener fighter. Uh, he's still learning on the job, got into the sport a little bit later. Mick Parkin, 28 years old, just eight pro fights, but has shown that he has some legitimate potential. Uh, we saw what he did on Dana White's Contender Series where he submitted Eduardo Nives uh, within two minutes. It was very impressive. Now, Nives is not really a uh, legitimate talent, uh, but then after that, he goes into the octagon, outpoints Jamal Pogues, who Jamal Pogues isn't the best of fighters, but Jamal Pogues is very good at doing exactly what Parkin did to him. We just saw Pogues do that again in his last fight against the wrestler. He's good at outpointing fighters on the feet, and we saw Parkin do that to him, so he shows he has this, this, the striking element, and he really outworked Pogues on the feet. He outclassed him there. Then in his next fight, his most recent fight, he went out there, outgrappled uh, Chow Machado. Uh, so Parkin is showing... To be a well-rounded fighter, you got to love the fact that he surrounds himself with guys like uh, Tom Aspinall. You guys know how I feel about Tom Aspinall. Um, you know, th th these guys, they, they got something brewing over there in England, man, these these big heavyweight dudes. And look at this, man. I'm, I'm a big fan of Eddie Hall. Uh, I don't know if you guys follow Eddie Hall, one of the world's strongest men. Uh, he's not a competitor these days, but an excellent content creator and just an awesome dude. But he's been dabbling in the MMA world a little bit, and uh, Tom Aspinall has been doing some stuff with him. And, uh, you know, Parkin is surrounding himself uh, with, with these types of guys, and these guys are real competitors. Do understand, man, this guy, uh, Eddie Hall, is a real competitor uh, in, in what he did. And, um, you know, just bringing that up. But, um, you know, in regards to this fight, man, Muhammad Usman, a stud athlete, an explosive dude, especially for the size that he brings into the cage. Uh, technically, I'm not 
so crazy about his skill set. I mean, we saw in his fight against Zach Payuga, uh, that was a fight that he was down in the scorecards, and he, he hit Payuga with a sloppy hook. It came from way out east, and, and you know, I'm not really too fond of his technical skills. I think he got away with something there. And then against Junior Toffa, Junior Toffa is an excellent striker, but really is lacking with his grappling and his takedown defense. And we saw Usman take advantage of him there. And then Jake Collier, Jake Collier, man, let me not go in on Jake Collier, man. Jake Collier should still be fighting down in the welterweight or middleweight division, man. He comes in out of shape and whatever. He, he does his thing. But um, the point I'm making here is I think that Mick Parkin is very different than those other three men we just talked about who Usman just recently faced. Mick Parkin's a legitimate heavyweight fighter that has some legitimate skills here. And, uh, you know, Usman's, like we talked about, is a phenomenal athlete. He's a big dude. He's an imposing guy. But check it out, man. Uh, Mick Parkin has the same reach as him. Mick Parkin's two inches taller than him. Parkin's a big time heavyweight fighter that's going to uh, impose himself on Usman just as Usman has imposed himself on, on his opposition here. I don't see Usman being able to just uh, drag Parkin down and grind him out like he did to Tafa. I don't see him out striking Parkin here. I like uh, my boy Mick Parkin uh, to get a W here once again inside the octagon. He'll be 9-0 and and I think he'll really start to have some momentum behind him. Uh, is he going to get Usman out of there? Um, Usman has shown to be pretty durable in 12 fights. He's only been uh, finished once. Uh, it was via submission. Uh, Parkin just has one submission uh, on his resume there. He's been getting the majority of his victories via knockout. But my gut is telling me here that this fight is going to go to a decision. I think Parkin's just going to kind of outpoint Usman. Usman is a tough dude, and I could see him with that little herky-jerky style kind of just hanging around, and I see this fight going to a decision. I'm going to say that Parkin wins a unanimous decision. Uh, I promise you guys, as we, we slide over to the uh, betting odds, I promise you guys I will have that prop video out for you guys for this episode. My voice is back now. Uh, it's early in the week. I don't see any reason why I won't be able to hop on the mic later in the week and dive into these prop bets even more so. Uh, but right now, we're looking at the money line, and uh, Mick Parkin opened up as a minus 170 on my bookie. He He's now a minus 160. So action coming the other way. That's something that I would like to see. As you guys know, I'm targeting more of, of the Parkin side here. You can already grab Parkin uh, right around a minus 150. Uh, we've seen him as low as a minus 135 favorite on bet any sports. So, I mean, you can get a reasonable line on him. People are respecting Usman here. Uh, and, and as far as from the Usman side of things, I think that people understand that he got into the sport a little bit later. He is a, a stud athlete, and I think they're gonna they're expecting to see his his skill set just continue to grow, and they think that he could potentially hang around in this fight, um, and they want to see more from Parkin. But I like Parkin here to get the job done via unanimous decision. Don't even think about missing this fight. One of the most exciting fights on the card uh, taking place in the flyweight division. What do you know? Uh, more up and coming talent in this division. This ta this division is so exciting. Uh, and specifically, it's going to be so exciting in the next uh, one to two to three years as all this young talent rises to the top. And I'm telling you guys, I know some of you guys aren't crazy about the, uh, the, the, the title match that just was recently made between Steve Urseg uh, and the champ. Uh, but and Pantoja, uh, but understand that Urseg is the real deal. But all these young fighters are going to be working their way up towards the top of this division. These are two extremely young and talented fighters, both representing Brazil. Uh, Igor da Silva and Andre Lima both coming off victories on Dana White's contender series. Uh, Igor da Silva. Uh, fighting out of a shoot box. Uh, so, of course, he surrounds himself with some of the best in the game. Uh, he is a, a fight finisher. Uh, he's finished six of his eight uh, victories. He's, he's has an unblemished record. He's never tasted defeat. Uh, he has a mix of subs and strikes. I think that some people are thinking he's going to try to go to the, go the sub route here if he's going to have success, but we understand he's a dangerous striker as well. Andre Lima, though, on the other hand, he is a nasty striker. He has a kickboxing background. Uh, he's extremely polished on the feet. I mean, he moves like a video game character and I have to favor him getting the better of the striking exchanges. Also, when I break down tape on Igor Da Silva, even though he's had a lot of success striking and hurting guys in the feet, he's been hurt in some of those fights. I've seen him eat some big shots, get wobbled, and then eventually uh, regain his wits and then go to the grappling or whatnot. There was one fight where he was rocked and then he went to the grappling and got a sub. Um, so I, I am definitely favoring Andre here, even though I, I want to say Igor is a dangerous fighter there as well. Uh, but I think that Andre Lima will have an advantage as far as the striking goes. This guy has professional kickboxing experience. Uh, he's a little bit of an older, mature fighter, and that, that is his bread and butter. Igor Da Silva is going to have to be the more complete mixed martial artist. He's going to have to try to get this fight down to the mat, if you ask me. 
And, uh, and, and let me also note, uh, Andre Lima, uh, you know, he trains under a smaller gym in, in Brazil. Um, but I want to I want to just mention because, uh, you know, I was a big fan. I used to watch uh, Lucas Martins fight back in the day uh, for, for you OG fans of the game uh, of the fight game. Uh, I know you young bucks wouldn't be familiar with him, but Lucas Martins was a, a talented fighter in the UFC. He's the head coach uh, over there at uh, Team Lucas Minero. Uh, so, you know, that that's a great guy to learn under. Uh, and Lucas Martin. So just understand that Andre Lima is learning the the whole overall game in a great way. Uh, and we saw some of his grappling skills in effect on the Dana White's Contender Series fight. Uh, his opponent, uh, Rickson Zenadim, who's a dangerous fighter in his own right, was extremely hesitant in that fight. He knew he was outclassed. And, uh, and Andre had him down on the mat and had some, some nice little transitions here and there. So I think we can expect to see his game continue uh, to, to, to grow. And I feel more comfortable being on the the Lima side here. Uh, I, I think that that's that's where I have to be for the, for this fight here. Um, Igor will have a slight reach advantage. Um, both men around the same height. Nothing too much going on there. Uh, about a two inch reach advantage for Silva, but Lima's footwork that with the footwork he has that won't be too much of an issue. Man, he knows how to move around there, and uh, he'll close the distance and he'll work his way in and out. Um, so both these fighters have been finishers. Uh, obviously both men undefeated. They've, they've never been finished cause they've never taken an L. Uh, I think that we're going to see a knockout here for Andre Lima. I'm aiming for him getting a knockout within the first couple of rounds. I think these guys are going to clash and I've seen Igor De Silva hit and tagged up a little bit and Lima can, can end a fight. He has that type of ability with the way that he his striking is. So, uh, I'm going to go with the finish for, for Andre here in that spot. And, uh, right now we'll take a look at the betting line. Uh, Andre Lima on my bookie. He opened up as a minus 120 pick him. He's now a minus 170. So big action uh, coming in on him uh, just over the last couple of days, over the last five days since March 12th, filming this March 17th. Um, so, you know, initially this was more of a pick him type of fight. Uh, on some of these books, it opened up at minus 170. It's been flat, no movement. Let's take a look at Bavada. Uh, he opened up as a minus 155. He's now a minus 175. So settling in at that minus 175 mark, we're consistently seeing on these sports books, the action is coming in on Lima. And uh, that makes sense to me. Th that's kind of how I saw this fight. I know Igor De Silva is a talented kid as well, but Andre Lima, this could be a fighter that we're talking about that's fighting for the belt one day. I mean, we have to see about his grappling more so, but as far as the, the striking and the kickboxing, he could hang with the best in the division right now. I truly feel that. In the women's bantamweight division, we got Montserrat Rendon taking on Daira Zelen Um, uh, This division could definitely use some new faces. Rendon uh, just made her UFC debut where she did get a victory, uh, but she is up there in age at 35 years old. And Daria is a, a nice new face uh, to see added to the division as well. Another uh, another Russian uh, female fighter that has just kind of uh, came out of nowhere in, into the UFC. So uh, I like to see it. Um, but but in all seriousness, this division really needs uh, some some new talent to work its way through it. So um, now uh, I would say this, you know, and compared to other women's divisions, the bantamweight division is lacking the most. Uh, from a skill standpoint, and, and you see it even when you break down tape on on these two fighters here, uh, Rendon. Uh, a grappling base fighter. Uh, she comes in very good shape. Uh, she's a, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu champion over in Mexico. Um, I mean, so she has those grappling credentials, but I'm not a fan of her striking. I like her toughness. I like the pressure she brings, but her striking is is from very much east out from out east and west. I mean, she throws shots way out there. They're telegraphed. Uh, she was able to get away with that against Tamaris Vidal, uh, who Vidal had a nice fight before that. She had a nice finish uh, with her striking, but uh, not the most proven fighter. And, uh, you know, Daria is a fighter that is eight and one. Her lone loss came by way of uh, Melissa Mullins. We know her as Melissa Dixon. If you guys remember Melissa Dixon, she just recently made her UFC debut, looked very good. I had an official play in her, cashed. I believe that was an underdog odds as well. Melissa Dixon, Melissa, aka Melissa Mullins, is a legitimate fighter. Uh, Melissa finished her with one second left to go in the round, got her down to the mat, ground and pounded her. Um, so that's a legitimate loss there. It's against uh, against legitimate talent. And she bounced back with the victory after that, got her own uh, first round finish. Uh, I will say this much. As I was breaking down tape for this fight, I was very close to taking Rendon. Uh, she has that grappling aspect. She comes in, in phenomenal shape. Uh, for her age, and she has the octagon experience already. I thought maybe she could do something similar to what we just saw Melissa Dixon do. There's, there is potential for that. Uh, but then, you know, I, I watched 
uh, Daria's last fight. And, you know, the more I watch her tape, I think that she's going to have the better striking here. She's way cleaner uh, technically. I think she could land on Rendon on the feet. And as long as she just doesn't let Rendon get this fight down to the mat and, and kind of bully her in, in that regard, I think that this is her fight to win. And uh, why not uh, root her on, huh? And she'd be a nice addition to the division. And I think she'd be more fun for the division moving forward. So uh, that's the way I'm going to go uh, for the fight. Now, uh, Montserrat Rendon opened up as a plus 125 underdog on Bet Any Sports. She's now plus 135. So action going the other way here. Uh, let's see what we see. Uh, let's take a look on my bookie. On my bookie, she opened up as a plus 115. She's now plus 140. We're seeing steady action coming in on the the UFC newcomer, the, the Russian uh, Daira. Um, am I in agreement with this line movement? Not necessarily. I have a slight edge on the Russian girl here, but I'm not really too confident in it. And I wouldn't be targeting it as it gets up there, which I've seen it as high. I mean, as a, uh, as a minus 180, right? Dyer opened up as a minus 145 in my bookie. She's now, she's now a minus 180. I don't like that. And when we might watch the fight and, and you guys might be saying, Oh, tell her what were you, what were you talking about? Uh, she outclassed her on the feet and it may play out like that, but I need to see it more. I need to see her come into the octagon. I need to see her do that. Uh, against a tough, uh, a tough fighter like Montserrat who has some grappling in her back pocket. I need to see it before I'm banking on that. Okay, so remember this is the fight game. She very well may show up and, and handle business like that, but I'm not tagging a minus 180 line, and I wouldn't recommend you guys to do that. Um, but for those of you guys that need action in every fight, maybe you go that way. If you need action on this fight, I would be targeting the dog value on uh, Montserrat Rondon. She could push the pressure. She's very physically strong. Maybe she gets this fight down to the mat and has some success. Stephen Wynn taking on Jarno Irens. Fight taking place in the featherweight division. Stephen Wynn making his UFC debut after having two fights on Dana White's Contender Series going one and one. Uh, both those fights played out very differently. One In one fight, he was knocked out with a flying knee by the Publix uh, bag boy. If you guys don't know Publix, Publix is like the big supermarket here in Florida. Uh, that was all on Cruz, who was working as a Publix bag boy when he landed that flying knee. The next fight, uh, he had a beautiful uh, knockout victory over uh, you know, a fighter in A.J. Cunningham who just took a fight on short notice in the UFC and took an L. I, I really don't believe A.J. Cunningham is it. I, I don't. I don't believe he's it at all. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to his resume here in a second. Jarno Irens, on the other hand, he is 0-2 in the UFC, losing to Sangwoo Choi and William Gomis. I think both those fighters are very talented strikers. and. You know, the UFC is giving him one more opportunity here, and he knows that. I've seen some recent interviews with Jarno. He 100% knows that this is all or nothing for him. I think the UFC wants him to have success here. Uh, fighting out of the Netherlands has that Dutch kickboxing uh, background, even though he, he is a complete mixed martial artist, but fighting out of the Netherlands, I think the UFC knows there's a little bit of, of a gap uh, in, in the UFC world as far as p fighters from that, that, uh, that part of the world. You know, Dutch kickboxing, what uh, has always thrived right in the kickboxing world right and, and uh, glory and all these these major uh, kickboxing promotions and we don't really have a lot of fighters in the MMA world or specifically in the UFC that represent that part of the world and I think it would be a good opportunity if Arens could have success maybe other fighters that are going the kickboxing route start to come into the UFC uh, world into the MMA world and we've seen a lot of kickboxers having success over the last couple of years so just some food for thought there I think that Jarno Arens is a good fighter. Um, needs to prove a lot more. Steven Wynn's a good fighter as well, fighting out of uh, Team Fortis MMA, surrounds himself with some solid talent. Now, Steven Wynn is more of a, a technical boxer. Uh, he, he's a little bit more defensively sound, and uh, we saw him really thrive in that Cunningham fight with, with his boxing skills. Uh, but, you know, some of the things that Jarno does that I like is I think he's a little bit more of an athlete. I, I think that he'll have a little bit of an advantage when it comes to his movement in there. Uh, he, he's a fighter that, that, that moves well. He has good footwork, and he's just a little bit more uh, light on his feet. And I think that he can potentially out-volume win. Uh, another thing I do want to mention is, is that Steven Wynn, he's nine and one coming off that big victory. But when you take a look at the level of talent that he's faced throughout his career, I'm not impressed to say the least. Nobody stands out to me. So he's very unproven with the, the level of opposition there. That's something to take into consideration. Uh, both fighters uh, physically very similar. 
Um, this is a fight that I have capped very, very closely. I think it's, it's hard to say who's going to win this fight. Uh, I know I see a lot of people going the, the win way. People think that he's a little bit more proven and, um, I understand where they're coming from and I was close to going that route, but I'm going to take Jarno here, man. I, I think with this back up against the wall, I also like the fact that he's fought in the octagon in a uh, legitimate UFC fight two times. I think he'll be a little bit more comfortable, uh, with the situation, even though wins fought in the apex twice as well. Um, We've seen Win knocked out before. I mean, don't don't be shocked if if Arends lands a big shot. Hasn't been the biggest fight finisher, but he has some skills there. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Jarno uh, to get the job done here. Let's take a look at the betting line. I know Jarno is an underdog here. Uh, this is uh, one of the underdogs that that we're gonna target. Um, can't just give you guys favorite after favorite. I know you guys will go crazy if I do that. And this is one of those cards where I do tend to favor favor the favorites. Uh, but we will side with Jarno Arends. I think there's more value on his plus one sixty line to say the least. Uh, it might not play out like that. Steven Wynn, uh, we'll, we'll see how he looks with with the step up in competition. We'll see if the striking skills uh, translate and he looks good against a, a fighter in Jarno. There's potential for that. Uh, but Jarno could do a little bit of it all. I know he's very hungry and uh, I, I like the motivation he has going into this fight. I think that he can, can edge this out uh, with his volume. Uh, wouldn't be shocked if he lands a knockout shot. We've seen Wynn's chin tested, but I would favor maybe he outpoints him here. Um, and uh, maybe we'll we'll target some prop bets. Stay tuned for that video. Miles El Chapo Johns coming off a four and a half month suspension uh, for a failed drug test. We're going to talk a little bit more about that here in a second. Second out Cody Gibson, a uh, fighter that had an initial stint in the UFC years ago. Uh, went over to the regional scenes, been just continuing to grind. And uh, good for him. He's getting another shot to uh, to, to get a UFC career. Uh, rolling smoothly here. You know, back in the day, he, he took on Aljamain Sterling, the former bantamweight champ. Some of you guys oddly have uh, Sterling as the greatest bantamweight of all time. Uh, if you guys want to argue with me about that, hit me up in the comment section or go to my IG where I did uh, my greatest of all time for each division. I had that post uh, posted there and it's pinned in my profile, but uh, ah, so let me not go on about that. But nevertheless, Sterling one of the greatest bantamweights of all time. One of the greatest uh, of all time. So no shame in that decision lost there. Knocked out Johnny Bedford after that. Johnny Bedford is a tough fighter. They went on to have a lot of success in the BKFC world. Then lost to Manny Gambarian and Douglas Silva de Andrade. Two solid fighters. After getting cut from the UFC, you know he, he's went on and has had a lot of success. Even had a victory over John Dodson, a fighter I have a lot of respect for that took place over an XMMA. Uh, those fights were nice and free on YouTube if you remember that fight card. Uh, then he lost to Ray Borg over at Eagle FC, Khabib's promotion. Went to a decision, had some moments in that fight. Ray Borg's no joke. You guys know that. After that L, three victories in a row, uh, having success in the Ultimate Fighter, and then he lost to Brad Katona. Uh, in that the Ultimate Fighter finale. Okay, uh, let me just say this. I think that Cody Gibson is a, a well-rounded fighter. He's a tough dude. He could do a little bit of it all. I like his game. He's 36 years old, which is very old for this division. But if you know about him and you know what he's up to, this is a guy that that leaves no stone unturned. This is a guy that's waking up five o'clock in the morning, putting in serious work. Okay, I know he's extremely motivated uh, to get a W here. He's not taking this opportunity for granted, to say the least. So don't let the age fool you. He'll come in in phenomenal shape. Um, this is a guy that's put in a lot of work over, over there uh, at the pit. Uh, you know, with Chuck Liddell's old coach and all that. I mean, he's been around some of the OGs in the game. I like Cody Gibson, man. I like him here, okay? Um, but to play devil's advocate, if Miles Johns comes out and looks like he did in his last fight, which there's an asterisk next to that, right? Because Miles Johns uh, failed a drug test. He tested positive for the M3 metabolite, which is found in DHCMT, better known as oral turnable, an anabolic steroid, Right. Uh, so he did fail a drug test, and he but he looked phenomenal in that fight. I really like the work that Johns put in that fight because he did what Dan Argueta does against his opposition. He pushed the pace in Argueta and kind of broke him with the grappling late in that fight. His cardio prevailed. Did that have something to do with with that that oral uh, steroid that he took? I don't know, man. It's it's, it's hard to say. Um, Cody Gibson will have a three inch reach advantage. He can kind of pepper Johns up from the outside. Miles Johns is a little bit more clunky. Um, you know, he, he's technical. He has a nice tight guard, but he's a little clunky with the striking. I can see Gibson kind of peppering him up a little bit. And as they mix things up, Cody could have success as well. But if Johns is technically sound and, and is still in phenomenal shape, like he was in his last fight, there's potential. He can kind of grind Cody out, maybe sneak in a takedown or two and just kind of push the pace in him. Uh, I'm very torn on this fight. And, uh, you know, I am going to go with my initial gut 
which is Cody Gibson. I'm actually going to take Cody here. Uh, two fights I just want to mention real quick. John Castaneda just had an arm triangle choke uh, on Johns, and then uh, Mario Batista hit, hit uh, Johns with that knockout as well. So uh, Johns has been finished twice uh, before. Both of his losses, he was finished. Cody Gibson is a di diverse finisher, can knock you out or sub you. Uh, so if Johns pushes the pace, better be careful. Doesn't leave a limb out there. Um, I am going to take Cody Gibson here. I don't say it with a lot of confidence, but I'll be rooting him on. And I think that he's just very motivated right now. I like his experience. And I question a little bit with Miles Johns coming off that failed drug test. And I don't say it with an overwhelming amount of confidence. So if I'm kind of showing my cards here, this is probably a fight that I don't have any action on. I'm kind of just sitting back rooting on uh, Cody Gibson to get the job done. But uh, there's a couple moving parts here, a couple variables into this fight. And uh, we'll see how it plays out. Cody Gibson right now, uh, you could find him as high as a plus 110, plus 108 dog. I've seen him out there. Uh, you know, I bet online he's a plus 108 right now. Uh, but all in all, this fight uh, on some of these books, it's almost at even odds. There's a very slight lean towards Miles Johns' way. Um, yeah, this will be a fight that I just kind of sit back and watch, and uh, we'll see how it plays out. But uh, oof, uh, Cody Gibson to win the fight most likely via decision, but there's there's a, a very realistic possibility he can find the finish in this fight. He's a fight finisher. Miles Johns has been finished in his losses. Uh, if Miles Johns gets the job done, I would favor him winning a decision more so than getting a finish in there. This should be straight madness here. Ricardo Ramos taking on Julian Erosa. Uh, I talked to you guys earlier about putting that prop video out to you guys. We'll be looking into the under uh, for this fight here, Ricardo Ramos, uh, one of the more uh, electri <coughs> electrifying and diverse strikers in the fight game. Uh, this is a fighter that will throw spinning elbows at your face. Uh, he'll throw all types of wild attacks towards your way. Um, now, he has shown to have a little bit of a deficiency at times with his grappling. We saw him just submitted by Charles uh, Jordan early on. Uh, we've seen him submitted early on in his career. Uh, by lower level fighters like Manny uh, Vasquez. I think he caught him with the guillotine back in the day. That was a long time ago, though. Uh, but even some of these losses where he took uh, knockouts in, uh, some of those fights went down to the mat and he was controlled and kind of battered up a little bit. Um, now, that's not really Julian Erosa style, but do note that Julian Erosa has some nasty grappling. And as they are flowing and they're going at it, uh, if, if, uh, a, if an, an opportunity presents itself uh, for Erosa to maybe snatch up a Darce choke or, or, you know, if they're clinched up and they, they scramble and they kind of fall down a little bit, Erosa can snap on a, a sub pretty quickly here. Uh, he's a more well-rounded fighter, I would say, uh, is Erosa. Um, but he has some major asterisks next to his name right now going into this fight. And I'll tell you what they are. It's, uh, it's quite simple. He's coming off two knockout losses in a row. He was knocked out against Fernando Padilla, uh, who we'll be talking about here in a little bit, uh, and he was knocked out by Bruce Leroy. Both both those fights, uh, he got knocked out in the first round. Okay, so uh, you mix that with the fact he's 34 years old, his chin is really starting to to give out, if you ask me, and that's a little bit of a recipe for disaster. Uh, being matched up with a guy like Ricardo Ramos, who's going to throw the kitchen sink at your dome, and one of those can easily clip. Uh, Julian Erosa, and we could see Erosa finished here. Uh, again, just to play devil's advocate, as we said, just looking at the unders and whatnot, Julian Erosa can be is is more than live to find a finish in this fight in, in his own right. He brings the fight. He's going to come out, and uh, he's going to be looking to land his own shot. And we've seen Ramos finished uh, before as well. So um, th this fight's going to be fun. It's going to be a fun fight. Uh, now, Julian Arosa is a fighter that's landed 6.22 strikes per minute. Like I said, he's an extremely active fighter, but you have to note he's absorbed 6.35 strikes per minute. Okay. So it kind of nullifies itself there because yeah, he'll bring the fight. He'll look to land damage, but he'll be there to be countered. So uh, Ramos <clears throat> with a little bit of, of uh, a similar stat line, just uh, as far as ratio goes, uh, but just, you know, not as active and not being hit as much 3.21 to 3.78. I think that if Ramos fights an intelligent fight here. Uh, I think that that he could find the mark and get get Julian Arosa out of here. Uh, he's been putting in work over at Team Alpha Male, which is a great sign because we know his striking is re very refined already. Want to see him continue to work on his grappling and um, you know his submission defense and whatnot. Although uh, Team Alpha Male, uh, as of recently, you know, 
you know, I don't want to be too harsh on them, but you know, we just saw Corey McKenna, who's been putting in a lot of work over at Team Alpha Male, make a a, a horrific mistake jumping down to the mat immediately with Jacqueline Amarim. That was such a dumb move there. But uh, you know, hopefully Ricardo Ramos doesn't make a, a similar mistake there. And uh, I think Ramos can find the knockout in this fight, and that's where where I will go with my decision on this fight. I think Ricardo Ramos is going to get Julian Erosa out of there. I think he's going to hit a, a wild knockout and we'll see Julian Erosa uh, fumbling around until he eventually gets finished. But it'll be a fun fight. Uh, Ramos opened up as a minus 180 on Bet Any Sports and we see action going the other way there. He's now a minus 170. Uh, let's see what else we're seeing here. On um, Bavada, reach out to me if you want to sign up to Bavada. You guys know that's my sports book there. Uh, Ricardo Ramos opened up as a minus 145 and now he's a minus 165. So we see action really going the other way. For a brief moment in time though, he did touch minus 105, which is crazy. We saw the line go the other way and then now it's just, uh, he's just being steamed there. So I do have Ricardo Ramos getting the knockout here. I think he finishes this, this fight within the first round, but uh, I would say comfortably two rounds and under. I think they clash early on. And as far as the money line goes, Probably would like uh, Ramos maybe more towards like 160 and down. Not necessarily crazy, but like the minus 190 we're seeing on my bookie. Be a little bit careful there. But I, I, I'm i going to go towards the Ramos side here, even with the, with the, the money line. You know, it's depending on what line you can get, but I'm still favoring chalking up those odds. I, I just want to reiterate, I just don't like the fact that Eros is coming off two knockout losses and he's getting up there in age for this division. Solid matchmaking here. Trey Ojin taking on Kurt Halaba. Now, this fight reminds me of a fight that we just talked about. That was the Miles Johns uh, versus, <clears throat> excuse me, or Miles Johns versus uh, Cody Gibson, right? And there's just some similarities. Kurt Hollibaugh kind of reminded me of the Cody Gibson side, uh, the veteran in the game, a fighter that had an initial stint in the UFC, was let go, made a return, uh, worked through the ultimate fighter. Trey Ogin, a fighter that uh, is newer to the UFC, Similarly to what Miles Johns is, um, you know, not exactly the same, but uh, Trey Ogin having success as of recently, looking very good as of recently in the cage. Uh, Trey's coming off probably his best performance of his career uh, against uh, Nicholas Mota. Even though that fight was stopped early, we we know that he was on his way to finishing that fight. Looked very good there. Um, lost to Ignacio Baja Mendez, one of the young studs in the game, and then somehow pulled off a decision against Daniel Zuliber. Uh, one of the young studs in the game. I don't know how he pulled that victory off. Um, Daniel is is looking phenomenal. I think Daniel just had an off day there, but you know that was a big fight for him. Uh, then he lost that Jordan Levette fight. That was an extremely close fight uh, that was in his UFC debut, and um, that, that fight could have went either way. Realistically, realistically, it was very close. Now, I want to talk about a couple of L's that he's had on his career or throughout his career that, that are very questionable to me. He was submitted by Nick Brown and then Thomas Gifford two times. All right. I, I've seen Thomas Gifford fight live a couple times. I'm very familiar with him. Um, you know, this is a dude that brings his Bible into the cage with him. Nothing wrong with that. He's a, a you know, a high IQ type of fighter, but he's really not it. He's not it at all. And uh, he, I know Gifford has some sub skills, but you shouldn't be getting submitted by Thomas Gifford uh, two times. Uh, so, so that is a little bit of a question mark I have in regards to him. Also, you t you could say that it all was back in the day and whatnot. You know, one of them, in 2017, one in 2018. Talking about six years ago, I mean, Trey is 34 years old. He was around 28 years old. It wasn't like he was extremely young. Uh, he's definitely a better version of himself right now. But still, I, I have some question marks about that because Kurt Hollibaugh, although he is up there in age, he's 37 years old. This is a fighter that is just, he's all in right now. You could tell, man. Um, I had the pleasure to talk to one of his teammates and uh, s someone that I believe even work, kind of worked with him with his management and whatnot, DM me when the Ultimate Fighter was going on. If you guys remember... I kind of knew Kurt was going to make it to the finale uh, early on in that season, if you guys know what I'm saying. So um, Kurt had a lot of success on that show and uh, looked great in the finale against Austin Hubert. He's finishing these dudes, smashed uh, Conor McGregor's boy, Lee Hammond, submitted him there, knocked out Jason Knight. I like the fact that when Kurt has a little bit of a slow start in his fights, he's, he's just uh, never gives up on himself. He's coming in with great cardio. And uh, I, I like what I've been seeing from him and I expect him to be game in this fight. And, uh, you know, here's the thing. Trey will have about a two inch uh, reach advantage. And in his last fight, he was really showing some development with his striking. I could see him kind of peppering Kurt up from the outside. And Trey also has some good grappling skills. Oh, man, I'll tell you what, though, man, I'm going to I'm going to go with Kurt Hollibaugh, man. He's an absolute dog and he might have a little bit of a slow start, but I think that. 
He could be live to get a submission here in this fight. He has nasty sub skills. We've seen Trey submitted. Like I talked about some of these questionable fights he was submitted just a couple of years back. I'm going to go with Kurt Hollibaugh here. Uh, Trey's not that young either. I mean, I know that that three-year difference does does help. 34 compared to 37 is, is a good advantage there. But I'm going to say Kurt has a little bit left in the tank. He's coming in with a lot of confidence and he's motivated. I'm going to take Kurt Hollibaugh uh, to get the job done here. Okay. Uh, that's going to be an underdog pick. Uh, we see Kurt as high as a, a plus 130 underdog on some of these books. On my book, he's a plus 120 right now. Uh, slight action coming in on Trey as well. Uh, we're kind of seeing the action go more towards Trey's way. Um, let's see what else we can see. Let's see what Bavada is talking about. Yeah, Bavada opened up Kurt as a plus 114. He's now plus 121. So the action has been coming in on Trey. I understand it. He looked very good in his last fight. I think there's potential for him to, to pump the jab, have success standing. But I'm going to say Kurt makes this another dog a junkyard dog type of fight like he's been doing every time as of recently in the last couple fights he makes these wars and he prevails in them so give me kurt give me my boy kurt to get the job done here uh and i think this submission is live we're hitting up the main card here luis Pauelo taking on fernando padilla a fight taking place in the featherweight division padilla uh, you know coming off a frustrating fight right against kyle nelson um I don't like the way he fought in that fight, to be quite honest. He's still a young fighter and he's learning. I think there was some some IQ issues going on there. Uh, there was some activity issues as well late in the fight. But Kyle Nelson's an older fighter. He's an OG in the game. And uh, he used that that veteranship to kind of edge that fight out. Uh, before that, I mean, he looked phenomenal against Julian Neroso, who we just talked about earlier. Had that nasty knockout on him in under two minutes. Um the striking is there. He's a nasty striker, but he's also a very dangerous grappler as well. He has some uh, some wild subs that he could pull off. Uh, he has a diverse uh, sub attack. And I like Fernando Padilla. I think that that last loss that he just took was a great learning experience for him. He's just 27 years old. I like the fact that he already has 20 pro fights. I think that as he as he hits his stride here, as he goes into 28, 29 years old, I think that he's going to He's going to get this train rolling. He's going to he's going to start to make some noise in this division. At the very least, I think he's a fighter that hangs around in the UFC. Uh, Luis uh, Pauelo is a fighter. Not so sure I could say the same thing, to be honest. I know he had a nice little victory on Dana White's Contender Series uh, where he he broke Robbie Ring, but I don't know about Robbie Ring, okay? Uh, Robbie Ring is a wrestler that I don't, I don't really know if he's uh, uh, a legit fighter, okay? And uh, as I look through his resume... There's not a lot of fights that stand out to me. So Luis has a lot more question marks in regards to him, in my opinion. I know he's been getting a lot of knockouts, but it's been against lower level competition. Fernando Padilla has never been finished in all five of his losses. They've come by way of decision. He's shown to be durable, shown to be tough. Uh, Luis uh, Paolo has has eaten some shots on the feet. I've seen him tagged up a little bit, and I wonder how he'll look when he gets hit by Padilla because Padilla has fight ending ability. We've seen that. Uh, and you can say the same thing for Luis, but when I watch tape on Fernando, he's just a little bit more impressive to me. Uh, I like the fact that I've seen him in there with with the guy like Julian Arosa, uh, who's a more proven fighter. I've seen him in there with guys like Nate Richardson fighting over an LFA, uh, even went to a decision against Spike Carlisle, which Spike Carlisle is, is a real uh, legitimate fighter. OK, so I mean, I, I've seen that he's tested a little bit more. So the sub that he pulled off against Derek Minner. Uh, now, we don't know if Derek Minner was just throwing that fight. You know, if you guys know the whole deal with, with that and whatnot and shout out to Minner, you know, I interviewed him, you know, I got love for the dude, but you guys know a lot of funny business going on with his career. Uh, went to a decision against Dan Ige. Dan Ige is a fight finisher. Okay. So when you go to decisions with, with those types of guys, we understand that, that, uh, you know, you're, you're legitimate, you're durable. So I'm on the Fernando, Fernando Padilla side here. Uh, I'll make no bones about it. Let me be clear. Uh, I like Padilla to get the job done. He's a minus 170 on um, bet any sports right now. He is a, uh, a minus 170 on my bookie. Open up as a minus 150. Some slight action coming his way. I am in ingredients with the line movement. Uh, let's take a look at what uh, Bavada's got going on. Uh, he opened up as a minus uh, 135. He's now minus 165. If anybody has question marks in regards to, to Padilla, I think it was in his last fight, he slowed down a little bit and uh, you know he was kind of walking uh, Nelson down a lot, but he wasn't really letting his hands go at times. And that could be a little bit of an issue. And then, uh, and Pauella has shown to be pretty tough too. So um, he might just be a game dude, you know, when maybe he will rise to the occasion with the step up in competition. Those are some of the question marks that you have to consider. Uh, I like Padilla here. I would probably edge this fight to go to a decision just because both these guys have shown to be pretty durable. I could see this being an old fashioned scrap. 
and uh, in, in the, uh, the lighter weight division and it could be a fun fight, but it probably goes to a decision. But at the same time, Padilla might be able to uh, to end this fight. All right, he's a fight finisher too. So they they both are. But I could see maybe Padilla getting a hold of of something and pulling off a sub after he hurts uh, Paolo. We'll see how it, we'll see how it takes place. There's some moving parts there, but all in all, I like being on the Padilla side with the money line, even as it creeps up to 175, 185. I'm still on the Padilla side. Yusuf Zalal is getting another opportunity. At a UFC career here, second stint in the octagon, taking on Billy Q, a fighter that is kind of at the end of the road, if you ask me. Maybe that's a little bit of a harsh statement, but he's definitely at the later, the latter half of his career. 35 years old, still been having success in the cage, but um, he's getting up there in age. All right, so Zalau, 27 years old, uh, he's been having some some nice success since being let go by the UFC. Uh, he had some tough losses, so he started off his career. 3-0, and taking out Jordan Griffin, Austin Lingo, Peter Barrett. Uh, shout out to my boys, Griffin and Barrett. We, you, know, you know, we interviewed them both. They both follow me on IG. They're always showing love. Uh, after that, uh, he had, went on a three-fight losing skid, went to a decision against Ilya Taporia, the current champ. That's saying something in itself. Went to a decision with Sangu Choi and Sean Woodson, who are both very dangerous fighters, very solid fighters. Uh, had a draw against Damon Blackshear, who's another fighter that's proven. These are all high-level opponents that he that he uh, faced off here against. After be being let go by the UFC, he goes out there, and he's finishing basically all these dudes, right? And he's having some professional kickboxing fights, too. I like what he was doing over at Sparta, uh, the, the Sparta promotion. Um, if you guys are familiar with it, they have the kickboxing ring next to the cage. They do a lot of stuff like that. And I know he was fighting lower-level competition, but for a young fighter like Zalal, just 27 years old, I think it's great for his confidence and, and for his development. And he was going out there just uh, winning all these fights, uh, dominating some of these fighters. Um, you know, submitted this dude Vadim. That was an MMA fight. That guy Vadim was a a fighter that was just making his pro debut, but he was he was a kickboxer. Uh, so you know, still you have to kind of understand that these aren't the highest caliber of opponents. Dude, Jake Childers, kind of a a scrub fighter. Uh, but you know, you're gonna understand that Billy Q is a major step up in competition. But I still like. I still like what was going on there uh, for Zalal, right? He's becoming a better fighter. Now, where I think Zalal can have success in this fight is Billy Q, more of a grappling fighter, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu jiu -jitsu black belt, as is Zalal as well. Zalal is a, bla a black belt in Jiu-Jitsu as well. Um, but Billy Q, he's very aggressive. And when he's looking to land his shots, uh, he gets a little stuck in the mud in there. If you guys know what I'm talking about, you've seen it in some of his fights. He, he kind of, he's lethargic with his movement as he's looking for that shot and he's there to be hit. And as he gets more and more up in age, his defensive uh, skill set is going to diminish more and more. His reaction time is going to diminish more and more. And on the other hand, I think that Zalal is going to be moving nice and quick. He'll be pumping the jab. And I think he could touch Billy Q up. Uh, these are some small gloves we're talking about. You know that what we're talking about. This is an MMA fight. He just has to touch that chin up a little bit. I could see him getting a finish here against Billy Q. And if Billy Q wants to bring that pressure and try to uh, rip Zalal down against the cage, which we've seen Zalal struggle at times being taken down and whatnot, we know that that's something that he's just been working on uh, over the years. And he's just going to look better and better. I like the... The environment that uh, that that uh, Zalal uh, surrounds himself with, he has uh, Coach Montoya over there at Factory uh, X Muay Thai. Uh, you got guys like Brandon Royval, Chris Gutierrez. Uh, you got guys like Dustin Jacoby. I mean, there, there's all types of killers that that he surrounds himself with, and I think that even if he doesn't get the job done here, I think they'll give him another opportunity and he'll he'll get the ball rolling. I think that he will settle down in the UFC here. Uh, and I'm actually going to pick him. I'm going to say that he, he's, he kicks off this second stint with the W. I am. Okay. Uh, Billy Q, like I said, just uh, he's a dangerous fighter. And I know he's had some success as of recently. Pulled off the decision against Jackson. He got tagged up against Jackson too. He was stuck in the mud a little bit. He was bringing the pressure, trying to throw elbows. He got clipped a couple times. Edson Barbosa hit him with that knee. Um, you know, we've seen him tagged up a little bit. So, um, you know, I am, I am going to take, uh, the youngster as allow. I, I'm, I think that he can, uh, go out here and, uh, he can, he can get the job done here. I like the youth that he brings into the cage here has a two inch reach advantage. Both men, the same height Zalau's body is filled up a little bit more. So give me use of Zalau to get the job done. And I think that he's potentially live to get a knockout in this fight. All right. I think that, that he's potentially live for that. Uh, Zalau right now, right around at plus 125 plus 115 underdog. That's kind of what we're seeing here. Um, 
Zalao opened up as a plus 113 on Jazz Sports. He's now plus 126. We're seeing action coming in on Billy Q. Uh, I like I like the, the Zalao side. Um, and I think that I'm not in agreement with that line movement. I'm not crazy about targeting Billy Q here as a favorite in this spot. I think there's more value on the Zalao line. That's where I stand. Two of the brightest young stars rising in the UFC right now. Peyton Talbot taking on Cameron Simon. Uh, this is a great fight. Uh, I love the fact that the UFC is just matching these two studs up with each other uh, early on in their careers. I, I don't have a problem with that at all. I'm going to enjoy watching this fight and uh, we'll see who prevails and uh, potentially who is on track to have uh, the more promising career, if you will, or, or who's going to get that, that quicker start to their career. Now, if Cameron loses this fight, it uh, could be a little bit of an issue for him. Uh, it's not the end of the world, but he'll be on a two-fight losing skid. Just lost to Christian Rodriguez. My boy C-Rod came through on that big underdog play uh, for me this past weekend. I'll be honest with you guys. I had that fight as a draw, okay? But still, I, I felt uh, more than happy to uh, to cash in and take my money there. But I did have C-Rod winning that, that third round 10-8, and uh, I did not have a 10-8 uh, for Delgarian in the first round, as you guys see, they're not scoring the wrestling the same as landing strikes. So let me not, let me digress from that. But C Rod is the truth. Uh, Talbot is the truth too. So Cameron has a, a tough test in front of him here. Cameron has beautiful footwork, uh, changes uh, stances so smoothly. He's an excellent striker. He's a well-rounded fighter. Cameron, you guys know he's a fighter that's been involved in the fight game from a very very young age. His father owned uh, a promotion uh, over there in uh, South Africa, and um, so that this is a young kid who's been involved in the in the fight game for a long time. Don't let the twenty three year old uh, Mark there uh, discourage you from 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 him. Right, he's a, he's a talented young kid who's on a, the fast track now. Peyton Talbot, twenty five years old, he's seven and zero. Had a slow start to his UFC debut. If you guys remember that, he was a huge favorite against Nick Aguare. Aguare is an underrated fighter. Not a lot of people know about him. Uh, but you saw once Peyton. Uh, got things going. You saw the difference in that fight. And he's a fighter that does tend to have slow starts and then tends to pick up the pace. We saw that against Reyes Cortez as well. And once he picks up the pace, I mean, he really puts it on these dudes. He has a diverse amount of attacks. Um, it's kind of like his personality, man. This is the type of dude like that you would think he's like on pe peyote out in the middle of, of the woods here. And, uh, or out in the desert, and it kind of has that fighting style, man. He's just like an, an open minded type of dude, something Lenny Kravitz vibes coming from him. And uh, I'm excited to see him perform, and I'm excited to see how far he pushes his his career. I think he's a kind of like a new age type of fighter. Um, he attacks from different angles, and uh, he'll whip a head kick up there when you're hurt. He'll knock you out in a variety of ways. His highlight reel is fun to watch, and uh, his grappling is is dangerous too. Um, so I've been a little bit back and forth with where I was going to go for this pick. I'll tell you what, I, I didn't like the way that Peyton struggled as I rewatched that tape early on in his last fight. And I think there's potential Cameron can give him some problems there. Uh, but I like the size advantage that Peyton has here. Uh, he's going to have about almost a, almost a four inch reach advantage here. Uh, he's taller, he's more lengthy. And, um, I think he can give Cameron some problems there fighting from the outside. Uh, Cameron, like I said, has great footwork and he, he'll hang and whatnot. I think this could be a, a fight that plays out very closely. But the more I broke down tape on Peyton, I edge him here. Uh, I would like to see him start off quicker. I would really like to see him come out the gates and having success. Uh, but but once he does, I mean, and you'll see all types of wild stuff like this. I mean, this is what you're going to see from him. And I think he's going to hit his groove in this fight. And um, I, I think that you know, I, I like being on the Peyton side. Again, go watch his highlight reel. I remember this in one of his highlights. He drops this dude and he hits him with the with the Cody uh, chin grab. Um, knees are going to be coming up the middle, all types of wild stuff. And um, like I said, his grappling is coming around. And one thing I also noted too, I saw an interview with him as he talked about his last performance, which he wasn't so crazy about his start. And he was talking about his, the mental side of things and what he was thinking as that fight was going on. And, and this is a dude that doesn't, uh, he doesn't wilt. So if things aren't going his way I and mean, he was talking about what he was saying to himself and how he gets himself pumped up. I mean, this is a guy, even when he has those slow starts, he's going to come out there, even if he's down and he's still going to be expecting to finish you in the second and the third rounds. He's going to still expect to dominate you. Um, he's cut from a little bit, a little bit of a different cloth. I like what I've seen from him and I, I like the attitude he brings into the cage here. Cameron, I just throw this out there too. I mean, I don't know. Is this a fighter that should be fighting in the flyweight division? I don't know. He's just not that big for this division. Something to keep an eye on there. Maybe he, the, the size is going to give him some issues in the bantamweight division. Uh, something just to take note there. 
Um, and Cameron with landing 6.66 strikes so far under the UFC banner, really putting a high volume out there, only being hit 3.12. Great ratio. Great ratio for Cameron as well with the 5.28 to the 3.24. Uh, two studs. But let me get on the, on the Talbot side here. That's the side I'm going to settle in on. Uh, you could still catch Talbot as... as uh, low as a minus 125. He's seen some action coming in on Cameron. He opened up as a minus 145. Peyton Talbot did. He's now minus 125. So we see action go coming in on Cameron there. Uh, let's take a look at what Bavada is talking about. Uh, Talbot opening up as a minus 125. He's now a minus 140. Kind of the opposite trend on, on that on that book, on my book. Um, Jazz Sports, 110 to a minus 121. So we're typically seeing slight action coming in on Talbot. Uh, but on some sports books, we're seeing it the other way. But um, I think that Talbot will probably settle in right around a minus 145, 150. And, uh, I like being on Talbot regardless, 150 and down. I still find more value on his side. I think he rises to the occasion here. I think he has a quicker start to this fight than he did in his last fight. Hey guys, two things and I'll make it real quick. If you guys are looking to work with me for my official plays, do not hesitate to shoot me a message. I got my email, IG, and Twitter scrolling below. Shoot me a message and I'll give you my price in there uh, from, if you guys want my official plays. Uh, also, if you want my official plays and uh, you, you want them a different way, you could also just sign up to Bavada.lv through my referral link. You'll get an added bonus to your account, and I will give you an entire uh, month uh, of my official plays. You get a one-month package there. So just throwing that out for you guys. If you're interested, reach out to me. Edmund Shabazian taking on AJ Dobson. Fight taking place in the middleweight division. Crazy to think Edmund Shabazian still just 26 years old. I think he made his UFC debut or came off Dana White's Contender Series when he was like, uh, 22 years old uh, or so. So, I mean, um, you know, he still has so much time to grow as a fighter. We're going to see rapid growth in his fight game. Uh, if you remember hearing stories about him as he came into the UFC, I mean, this is a dude that was, uh, you know, uh, very polished with his Brazilian jiu-jitsu skills. He was winning a lot of big tournaments over there uh, in California and in, in the States. Uh, he's a fighter that's striking, looks very good when you watch him in the cage. He's a very polished striker. Uh, he's had... Some tough fights, but I mean, look at the the losses that he's taken. Uh, coming off a loss where he was finished against Anthony Hernandez, that was a fight that he was outlanding Hernandez, started off nice in that fight, but then Anthony Hernandez, we know he's cut from a different cloth, just was uh, sticking his tongue out, throwing peace signs at him as he was getting tagged and just kept walking Shabazian down until he eventually broke him there. Um, had a nice knockout over Dolce at Lingambula before that. But then look at these losses. Nazaruddin Amavov, Jack Hermanson, Derek Brunson. I mean, these are legitimate veterans of the game, not even veterans. I mean, these are, these are top 10 type of fighters in the division. And Edmund was fighting these fights and he's, you know, 25, 24 years old. So, I mean, he had a real tough task in front of him. Let's not forget he finished Brad Tavares, a fighter that's not easy to finish, submitted Jack Marshman, knocked out Charles Bird, uh, had a very toughly fought fight against Darren Stewart, a veteran at the game at the time. That was a fight where he really showed he could dig deep. I'm, I'm still high on Shabazian. I think that he still will grow as a fighter, and I think that he is a, a good fighter. I think he's a good fighter. I think he's a top 15 caliber fighter in this division as time moves on. AJ Dobson, we've seen some ups and downs from him as well, uh, fighting under uh, Matt Brown. And uh, shout out to Mark Coleman. You guys know the story of Mark Coleman. Shout out to Coleman, uh, an absolute hero and legend of the game. I know Mark Coleman has, has kind of been in AJ Dobson's uh, circle as well. Uh, he's been kind of cornered Dobson throughout the years. And um, just to, so you understand the type of people Dobson surrounds himself with. All right. He's a mature fighter who has some gr great um, people in his circle coming off a nice victory over Tafan Chukwi. Uh, Tafan didn't really show up for that fight. Tafan was taken down, controlled a lot. Um, it was kind of good for AJ Dobson to show that that development in his game because we've seen him struggle a little bit with his grappling at times. We saw Jacob Malkoon control him for that entire fight. Uh, you go back to his Dana White's Contender Series fight and uh, he, he uh, hurt uh, Hashem early in that fight with his striking, eventually pulled off the sub, but really set that finish up with his strikes. He does carry some big power. He's 32 years old. He's not a spring chicken, even though he only has a couple pro fights. I mean, he's a he's a mature man right here. You know, where Edmonds a 26 year old young young dude. Uh, AJ Dobson's a mature fighter that's in his physical prime. Um, with that all being said, you know we talk about who these fighters are keeping in their circle and whatnot. Edmund Shabazian, he's been uh, extensively training with Sean Strickland. Uh, he's been training over there at Extreme Couture over in Vegas. I think that's going to do wonders for for him uh, and his development. I think his uh, he's a, a he's already a very tough fighter. We've seen that in the cage. I mean, he's taking some serious damage. He's never given up on himself. Um, but he's just going to 
he's going to really start to uh, thrive with his with just his durability and his toughness in the cage, if you ask me. I, I really believe that. If you surround yourself with a guy like Sean Strickland, I think he's putting in some serious rounds uh, with his sparring. And uh, when, when his fights are really starting to heat up. I think that he's going to be very comfortable in those situations. And we've even seen that. Like I mentioned, the Darren Stewart fight. So um, also, I think that Edmund Shabazian is the, is the more, uh, he has better finesse with his striking. I think he can outpoint Dobson as long as he doesn't get clubbed by a big shot. If Dobson wants to push the grappling, I think Edmund Shabazian's jujitsu is nasty as well. I add Shabazian there. I like Edmund Shabazian in this spot. I do. Um, Dobson has never been finished. He's shown to be very durable. I'm kind of edging Edmund winning a decision here, uh, in this matchup. Edmund Shabazian right now, uh, he's a bet, uh, excuse me, a minus, he's a minus 185 on bet any sports, uh, on Bavada. He's a minus 185 open up as a minus 195. So a slight movement the other way. Uh, but he's just under a, a two to one favorite. He's a minus 200 on my bookie. That line hasn't moved at all. I expect him to settle in right around a minus 200, minus 190. You're paying about almost two to one odds on him. Um, could be a little risky per odds, uh, but I still like being on the Edmund Shabazian side. I like him via decision here. Uh, we'll talk more about some prop bets for that fight as the prop video comes out, but I like being on the Edmund side. I think he rises to the occasion here. I think he shows up, gets a W. The big boys throwing down on the main card. Carl Williams taking on Justin Taffa. Uh, Carl Williams has been having a lot of success in the cage since that Dana White's Contender Series uh, performance that he had where he went out there and out-wrestled uh, the Penn State uh, Division I. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to... I don't want to just throw that out there. I forget if he was a, a national champ, but I know he had some serious credentials. He was a Penn State wrestler and Jimmy Lawson. And I thought that was very impressive the way Carl Williams was taking him down, uh, you know, mixing things up and just being the better mixed martial artist out there. Uh, since that that fight, uh, victories over Lucas Breschke and Chase Sherman. Uh, he's been kind of just a, a decision type of fighter. Uh, but you know what, when you got money on him and he's getting the job done, that's really all you care about, right? I mean, he's doing his thing. He's mixing things up. He's a great athlete, uh, for this division and per his size, Justin Taffa, a phenomenal kickboxer, a sniper. He will look for the knockout in this fight. And, uh, we know that he's a fighter that, that, uh, can, can definitely start you. We saw him just go out there and get sweet redemption against Austin Lane after Austin Lane poked him in the eye, uh, in that first fight, knocked Austin Lane out. With ease, uh, knocked Parker Porter out, aka Pork Reporter, uh, knocked out Harry Honeysuckle. I love stringing those names off, you know, and uh, you got to really just appreciate it as we get these opportunities because we won't be talking about uh, Porker and Harry Honeysuckle uh, as time moves on and we never see them in any UFC fights. But uh, no, did lose a decision to Jared Vandera that it was not a good look. Lost to Carlos Felipe. Felipe, it was a good fighter. I don't know why the UFC parted ways with him. Uh, knocked out Juan Adams. Shout out to my boy Juan Adams, the first fighter we interviewed on MMA Live Discussion. Um, you know, but but he was actually knocked out against Jorgen De Castro as well. Let's not forget he was knocked out against Jorgen De Castro. Um, all in all, I, I do believe Justin has a good chin. But uh, these are this is the heavyweight division, and with Carl's speed and, and movement, if he's changing levels, don't be shocked if he if he catches Tafa on the chin and knocks him out. I want to throw that out there. Um, Obviously, don't be surprised if Toffa lands his own knockout. I mean, that's what he does. But I'll tell you what, the way I see this fight going, I think that Carl Williams with his athleticism and uh, his speed and whatnot, I think that he's going to change levels and uh, just kind of be in control of this fight. It won't be easy uh, to take Toffa down. I mean, you, you, you take a look at Toffa's uh, takedown defensive rate. It is at 100%. He has not been taken down in the UFC thus far, but he hasn't been tested there extensively and uh i don't know carl williams has looked pretty good at changing levels he might catch him slipping and, and get on top of him and we'll see how Tafa looks on his back he might look a little bit like a turtle um and uh you know besides that you know uh that's not really something we need to, to talk about really but uh 100 percent takedown defensive rate for carl williams but Tafa's not looking for a takedown in the slightest we don't even need to talk about that and um, and we already mentioned that that Carl Williams has looked good offensively with his takedowns at times uh, in that Dana White's Contender Series fight. So, yeah, I am on uh, Carl Williams to get the job done here. I think that Carl Williams uh, should be able to push the pace. And as long as he avoids getting hit with that big shot early on, you've got to favor him with the activity and just kind of out-voluming Toffa in the later rounds and just being the better athlete out there. All right, so that's kind of how I see this fight going down. Uh, I'm seeing Williams as high as... Uh, as a minus two seventy, it's where he opened up on my book. He's now two thirty, but I mean, I've still seen him seen him up there. He's more around a two forty, two thirty right now. Uh, you're paying over two to one odds on Carl Williams. Uh, it could be risky, 
Like I said, that 100% takedown defensive rate of Tafa. Tafa's been hitting on all cylinders. If he's stuffing takedowns and just kind of methodical out there and he's landing his strikes, or if he just lands that big strike, only takes one, he could definitely get a knockout. Um, so not sure if I'm crazy about the minus 230 uh, and up type of odds. If that line continues to trend down, maybe that's something that will intrigue me. Um, right now, I'm, I'm kind of just sitting back and uh, analyzing the line movement there. Uh, but I will take Carl Williams to win this fight via decision. Here we go, guys. We're at the main event. Amanda Ribas taking on Thug Rose Nama Yunus. You know, I just want to say this. For those of you guys that remember, <clears throat> I used to give uh, Thug Rose a little bit of a hard time here and there throughout the years, but I am actually a fan of hers. I, I like her a lot. I think she's actually a really good person. Uh, you know, I just remembered her from the ultimate fighter where she kind of had this immature, like uh, little attitude. If you remember her from back in the day when she had hair and whatnot, and she had that nickname thug and, uh, my spider senses were telling me that she really wasn't about that life. And she was kind of trying to sell herself as she was like a thug and her explanation for why she got the name. I, I, I don't know. It just, I kind of smelled fraud. And then remember when the glass fell on her from when Conor McGregor threw the, uh, the thing through the bus and then she was crying and all that and had uh post-traumatic stress. You know, I was kind of, kind of harsh on her, but I want to say this. I think that she just, uh, she, it, it, I shouldn't be so harsh on her. I mean, she's a good person. And I think that she didn't really just, uh, she didn't really mean what she was saying. She knows she's not a thug. She's just a, a good human. Uh, she's a spiritual type of person and uh, she's an excellent fighter. I'll tell you that. She's one of the greatest uh, women's mixed martial artists of all time. She's a sniper. Uh, she's a little bit of a head case and we've seen her make some, some mental mistakes in the cage at times. A uh, little reminiscence there when she got slammed on her head by um, Andraj. Uh, but even specific, more specifically in her last fight, uh, excuse me, not in her last fight, in the fight before that against Carla Esparza, where she completely froze up and didn't let her hands go uh, at all in a fight she could have easily won. That was a little bit alarming. Uh, looked great against uh, Whaley in both those fights. Got the knockout there with the head kick, won the re the rematch. Um, she lost to Menon Farot. Now remember, that's how she bumped up in weight to this division. Uh, she was the strawweight champion. This is up in the flyweight division. She's trying to settle down in this division. Just 31 years old. Um, I think that she will get her feet under her here. Um, this is a good matchup for her in the sense that Amanda Rebus is a, a great fighter, very fun fighter to watch. Uh, and she puts a lot of activity on the feet, but Rebus throws a lot more trash out there, if you will. And she'll get away with that on lower uh, level fighters that are just kind of get overwhelmed with the activity. Uh, but Thug Rose is a fighter that when she throws, uh, her, her, her strikes mean a lot more. So you see that the Rebus throws 4.92 uh, strikes per minute while Thug Rose throws 3.68. But Thug Rose's strikes land a lot cleaner with a lot more umph to them. And Amanda Rebus is a fighter that has shown to have some defensive flaws and has shown to be finished. You guys know I faded her before uh, recently. And I've bet on her too. We've actually, we've done very well as far as like I had an official play on her against Vivian Arajo, uh, but then I faded her against Macy Barber. And I also faded her to get knocked out in that fight. I targeted Macy via TKO KO because I know that Rebus eats shots. And if you get a fighter that has that type of power, they're going to have opportunities to land and they can get her out of there. And I think that Nama Yunus is that type of fighter. I mean, come on, you saw what she did to Zhang. She can hit her with the head kick. She can, she can finish this fight. And uh, I'm going to say that Doug Rose gets the finish here. If she shows up motivated and shows up ready to go, if she has her head on her shoulders, she can finish this fight. Now, if she doesn't and she's hesitant, Rebus will be throwing all types of volume out there and she'll be live to win a decision. Uh, so, so that's something that Thug Rose needs to understand. And uh, that's the question mark. You got you to gotta wonder what kind of Thug Rose we're getting out there. Um, but... I, I hope though Thug Rose shows up. I hope she gets the job done. I'm rooting for her. And I'll say that she can get a finish in this fight. I, I truly believe she can get a finish in this fight. Uh, so give me Thug Rose to land some type of head kick. There's some nasty right down the pipe that that bloodies up Rebus. I think Rebus will be bloodied up. She's always bloodied up in her fight. She's going to be bleeding everywhere. She'll be tough though. She'll be marching forward. Uh, but I'm, I'm hoping that Thug, can, Thug Rose can hurt her bad and uh, ev eventually uh, end this fight somehow. I think that'd be an exciting way to end the card. Uh, Thug Rose is at minus 175 on Pavada, opened up as a minus 170, a little bit of back and forth there. I've seen her as high as a minus 190, which is what she's on my bookie. So maybe you're getting a bargain on that 175 and down line. Maybe we see Thug Rose settle in right around a minus 205, 210 by the time this fight takes place. I like being on the Thug Rose side of things. And I think we'll, we need to talk about some prop bets for this fight in that, that prop video. We will talk about some finish type of props or unders or, or things like that and see what kind of values out there.
All right, guys, that's going to wrap things up. Got to hit you with some parting words. Um, like I said, man, I've been I've been under the weather a little bit, so I, I like to give you guys better uh, parting words. I like to go deep and, and think of some new type of stuff. Um, but I'm tired, man, and my voice is almost gone. As you guys know, I want to let you guys know I appreciate you for hanging around. Uh, what I will say is, um, you know, today is St. Patrick's Day. And, uh, you know, we think of any just random little holiday. I would, I would advise you guys that all those little moments you go through in life, don't take it for granted, whether it's just a, a little holiday, 2024, St. Patrick's Day. If you're feeling good and you're feeling healthy, go out, hit the town up and breathe in that fresh air and just enjoy every little uh, mile marker as you go through your life, right? There's a, a saying, right? Stop and smell the roses as you go. And I would advise you guys to all do that. Take advantage of, of every day. Don't get caught just like staring at your phone, laying on the couch and letting these days pass you by. Get out and enjoy all these little moments. Uh, enjoy. Uh, what do we have coming up? Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo will be the next little, uh, little event like that. You can go have a good time. Uh, there's all different types of holidays, but I'm just using them as an example. Different opportunities just to get out and mingle with your neighbors and uh, and in your, your community and then meet people and enjoy life because it all goes by quick. And then before you know it, uh, you know, you know what happens at the end of the road. So enjoy it as you go and uh, just enjoy life. That's what I want to tell you guys. Enjoy, enjoy your health. All right, guys. And I'll give you some, some different type of stuff moving forward. Uh, I hope you guys all have a profitable event for this card. I hope you guys all have a great week. And again, you can expect that prop video to come out later this week and all types of content uh, will be coming your way. Signing out. Tell it. To the show, this is the MMA fortune teller. Yeah. The MMA fortune teller. The teller. The teller. The teller.